We're here at La Web and talking about small teams that are making a huge impact. Steve Jobs called it a dent on the universe. And uh, we're going to talk about entrepreneurialism and uh, Europe and La Web and have a fun conversation with Dave McClure, venture capitalist or something capitalist or venture, something. Venture capitalist. Venture capitalist, he calls himself. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm Dave McClure. Uh, I'm uh, an obnoxious, loudmouth venture capitalist. You don't sound that obnoxious <laughs> or loudmouth yet. Well, believe me. I can, <laughs> How do I, I get I can, you started? I can dial it up. <laughs> what are you seeing in the web? Uh, well, I guess uh, we're seeing a lot of startups that are doing great stuff uh, here in Europe overall. Uh, actually, 500 startups invested in about 10 or 12 companies in Europe. And uh, this is the place where it's all happening in Europe. Yeah. You know, you, you've been involved in some big companies like PayPal. It started small, it got big. Had a small I'm, role to play there. I'm interviewing yes. uh, the X.com executives on stage tomorrow. Oh, cool. Uh, to starting uh, these little companies that start on a picnic table uh, somewhere yeah. in Brazil or, <laughs> or in San Francisco. We actually or, are investing in Brazil, so that's I know one of the you places are, that I, we're doing. I follow you on Twitter. And it's like you're <laughs> in a different city every three days. <laughs> uh, sometimes that's true, yes. I just came here from uh, Tokyo, actually. We're seeing a lot of uh, a flood of new startups happening right yeah. now. Uh, some people say it's a bubble. Some people say we, we're getting too many incubators. Some people yeah, say no, I think there's probably way too many venture capitalists, not too many startups or too many incubators. Can there be too many venture capitalists? <laughs> yes, there can. Why? What, 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 unpack that. Why? Because it sounds like more, uh, well, more rich people in the world who are willing to spend money no, on venture No, no, I don't mean it that way. I mean, it's great to have more folks doing investing. I, I think there's a lot of change happening in the venture capital industry right now. I think you're seeing uh, both uh, the emergence of very large venture funds that are more than a billion dollars. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, I think the general trend is towards smaller funds, uh, both smaller seed funds and smaller incubators. So yeah. a very few number of large funds that are extremely well branded and have great returns and been able to raise billion dollar funds like Excel and Greylock and others. Um, and then there's uh, more typically, I think the traditional size fund that's been 250 to 500 million dollars has been pressured to probably either become more relevant, become more sector focused, or potentially get smaller. Yeah. What are you seeing? How, uh, you, you're one of the few people who really travel the world and see entrepreneurs yep. in Brazil and yep. Asia, Europe. Right. What are you seeing happen? Because I don't get out of San Francisco as much as you do. <laughs> Well, I would still say the majority of our investing, probably 50 or 60 percent of it, is in the uh, Silicon Valley Bay Area. Uh, probably another 20 percent in the rest of the U.S. Uh, in a number of cities: New York, Boston, Seattle, Chicago. Uh, but then we've started to spend more time in several international geographies. Uh, current portfolios maybe have been 10 percent international. Will probably be 20 to 25 percent international going forward. Uh, in particular. Uh, we've done probably 10 companies out of East Asia in China and Japan and a few other geographies. Uh, we've done at least 10 companies out of uh, Europe and London. Uh, and then we've hired a professional investment professional out of Brazil and starting to spend more time focused on that geography. And I would say going forward, we're looking at Spanish-speaking Latin America, India, and then potentially Russia and Eastern Europe and uh, maybe uh, Arabic-speaking market as interesting geographies down the road. Yeah. At Rackspace, I want to make sure that we're never blindsided by technology. Sure. What are you, and, and certainly we're seeing the, the move to cloud in a huge way. We're seeing yep. enterprises move there, we're seeing startups move yep. there. That's a Even a uh, new incubator that's based uh, just on cloud based services, right? I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what are what are what's happening in the technology of these startups that you're seeing? Are they building on Node.js? Are they what are they doing that's innovative sure. or interesting or a trend that you're seeing? Well, I think in general, just moving more and more backend services into the cloud and lowering cost. Um, so you're seeing that with a variety of things. Um, so Twilio is a company we're an investor in that provides voice and SMS in the cloud. Uh, SendGrid is another company we invested in that's doing. Uh, email deliverability services in the cloud. Uh, MyGengo is a company out of uh, Japan that's doing a crowdsourced platform for language translation. So uh, a lot of services that used to be delivered either inside the firewall 
or on a dedicated server are now moving into cloud-based delivery, outside the firewall, even in large secure enterprises that's happening. Uh, that reduces cost structure for a lot of companies, makes it easier for small teams and small startups to compete. Uh, and I think it also just allows companies to grow more incrementally. So companies like Rackspace that offer those services uh, can really take on a good bit of the risk and a good bit of the you know, cost structure for startups that are growing. Yeah, other companies that I'm seeing, like, like when I walk, walk into a startup now, even a two or three person you know, startup like Instagram was when I first saw them, yeah. they have these uh, data porn walls now <laughs> that are showing the health of their company. Right. Both the social part of their company, how are customers responding to you? I mean, using right. the Eric Reese metaphor, the lean startup right. metaphors. Right. And uh, the health of their infrastructure, using like New Relic uh, to see the health of their servers and whether right. things are staying up after they checked in some new code, right? Are, yeah, are you seeing that happen? Or? Well, I think uh, there's always a danger in looking at too much data, but I think generally, uh, you know, using dashboards both in terms of customer metrics as well as you know operational metrics in the business are becoming pretty standard. Um, I'm sure that was one of the things that was kind of cool when I was working at PayPal way back in the day was they had a pretty uh, common set of dashboards and screens that were available throughout the building that were showing uh, usage numbers, uh, growth in customers, also growth in like customer support costs and fraud and other areas. So not always positive metrics, sometimes you watch the negative metrics too, uh, either for uptime or other areas. When you see companies come and pitch you, what are sort of the metrics that you're looking for? What, you know, I mean obviously, number of users, you, you know, yeah. the basics, but what well, else are, what, I think what, before what you makes see, you uh, go, this company is really, I, yeah. I am interested. Well, I mean, I think when you see companies ramp either in terms of users or dollars, uh, there becomes a frenzy of activity from the investing side and others around them, but really the things that we look at tend to be more understanding in business models, uh, whether there's a simple way for the company to make money, uh, whether there's a dedicated customer segment or focus, and then simple, some simple cohort metrics and conversion numbers are interesting ways for us to detect whether the company's really figured something out. So that might be as simple as just you know conversion to email collection uh, percentages or bounce rates on websites, uh, download rates for um, for uh, mobile apps or services. Uh, but really, I think what's most important is just understanding conversion to active use, whether that's over a seven or thirty day period. Uh, and then really, you know, uh, willingness to refer other customers is also an interesting metric. The uh, net promoter score. Yeah, That's exactly. what we use at Rackspace to study whether we're doing our job right or not. Right. Are you willing to tell that no another person about our company? Right, exactly. It's a great, great question and a great stat to, to follow. Apple follows it, Nike follows it, we follow right. it, Domino's Pizza follows it, right? <laughs> I, I was just talking with them. Um, what, what else are you seeing from your eyes? I mean, because you're seeing sure. a, a unique, you have a unique angle on the world that uh, very few people get to have. Well, I mean, I think, you know, by doing a lot of the stuff uh, in different places around the world, you can see differences and similarities in businesses that are getting rolling. Uh, one thing that's really struck me over the last year or two that we're spending a lot more time in is consumer education. Um, particularly, I think, you know, is mobile like devices and apps that uh, help kids learn. Uh, and also introducing so gamification. So education apps. I was yeah. thinking almost like a Mint app, which educates the consumer about their behavior. <laughs> right? Well, that too, but I, th I think we're particularly spending more time on sort of the you know, target demographic really zero to 10, uh, and the women and families who sort of take care of those kids. Uh, we think we've really been trying to look for more women-based founders, uh, a lot of times, uh, obviously women can start any kinds of businesses, but we, We've seen a lack of attention to uh, business around families and parents and education for kids, uh, mostly because a lot of startup founders are single and male. Yeah. Uh, but we've uh, really been looking at ways to increase the number of companies that we uh, fund that are focused on kids and families and parents. Um, that's a huge growth segment, uh, particularly with devices like the iPad that have great monetization, credit cards built in, and are really reaching a lot of uh, people in the U.S. market, uh, eventually probably the Android market as you well. You got to be careful though, because if you're aiming at kids and they start buying stuff, the parents are going to go, "What the hell are you doing?" <laughs> <laughs> I think that's already the case. <laughs> yeah. It totally is. <laughs> my, but my, you know, my kids have bought stuff. You know, I was like, "Whoa, I got hit with a twenty-dollar bill there." <laughs> right. So watch your password usage, I guess, on that yeah. stuff too. But yeah, so we're really excited about consumer edu education for kids and. 
a lot of the techniques have been used for uh, traditional gaming and adult uh, sort of areas like Zynga. Now applying uh, gamification techniques to kids to help them learn better. It's right. pretty cool. Well, thanks for spending a little bit of your cool. time at the web talking with us. It's a really interesting co conference. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what you find here. All right. Thanks a lot. Go, go find some other great companies, man. Thanks. We will. Thank you.